All righty, we're going to pick it up then on session 48, lesson 9, page 15 in your, on your outline. And it'll be the allegory of the good shepherd and the thief. But before we uh, get there, let's take a look at our uh, review of where we were last week. We looked at the types of miracles uh, two weeks ago. Remember the types of miracles the rabbis uh, spoke about? Any man's miracles and then Messiah's miracles. Miracles performed by the Messiah alone. <clears throat> a healing of a leper, healing of a deaf and dumb, uh, the casting out of a deaf and dumb demon, and then the healing of a person born blind. And that's where we were last week uh, in the book of John with the healing of this, uh, this man. Now Jesus uh, spit on the ground and made mud out of the dirt, and he anointed the blind man's eyes and sent him to the pool of Siloam to wash. And we noted last week that that was in direct violation of the traditions of the fathers, a direct violation of the Mishnah, the oral law. And we see an example of that in Shabbat 108.20. This is the Mishnah, the oral law. To heal a blind man on the Sabbath, it is prohibited to inject wine into his eyes. It is also prohibited to make mud from spittle and smear it on his eyes. So Jesus stepped directly on that tradition and ground it into the dirt, okay? Well, why did he do that? Why did he issue that challenge? Well, first of all, to draw attention to this messianic miracle. He wants to <coughs> provide more evidence to the Judeans now, uh, living the people living in Jerusalem, that he is indeed the messianic person. Secondly, he wanted to emphasize that he is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath doesn't govern him, he governs the Sabbath. Thirdly, he wants to emphasize that true Sabbath rest includes good works, such as healing. And we've looked at the fact that the rabbis had a lot of traditions that prevented healing on the Sabbath. The only thing that they allowed on the Sabbath, basically, was uh, saving a life, and that was it. And fourthly, he wanted to emphasize the voluntary nature of the Mishnah. He sometimes followed the traditions, and he sometimes ignored them completely. And this is an example where he completely uh, de-emphasizes the, the uh, mandatory nature of the Mishnah. This, was ju this is just a, a uh, law preventing healing on Shabbat right. that had long been established. But those two elements, wine and or spittle. Oh, oh. So it's, it seems like a set-up heal. In other words, well, put that in the law. Well, this was the traditional law. law. Right. Well, I find it interesting that those would be the only two elements that they would use for the healing of a blind person. Spittle and well, I just used, I just took one little excerpt out of the Mishnah. Uh, I'm not saying that's the only... That I'd have to look up, but I just so pulled out of the Mishnah what was salient to this event. So he anoints the guy's eyes with his fiddle. And mud, yes. Mud. Yeah, and that's in direct violation of the right. traditions, yeah. He chose directly to violate that tradition, right. yeah. Uh, Yeshua sent the uh, blind man to the Pool of Siloam to wash, and he came back seeing. And we um, then looked at the P Pool of Siloam, the... Uh, the uh, true pool that has now been found a, a few years back. So we know exactly where the um, blind man went, and this is of course only p a partial view of that pool. Most of it is underneath that orchard to the left. Uh, then the um, Pharisees got wind, or the, the blind man was brought to the Pharisees because this was a messianic miracle and it was healing on the Sabbath. So they uh, wanted to question this guy at first, they didn't believe him that he had been blind and was healed. Uh, so they brought in a couple of other witnesses, his parents. And according to the biblical pattern, they established the truth of the healing with two additional witnesses. So this proved that the healing was not fake. This was the real deal. And the Pharisees, still unwilling to accept the evidence, then call the blind man back. And they begin to grill him as well. And uh, he stands up to them and um, kind of insults them. Do you want to be this man's disciple as well? You know, they said, we know the truth. This guy is a sinner 
uh, and you better tell us the truth. Give glory to God. You know, they're twisting his arm. See things our way. Well, do you want to be his disciple? So then they cast him out. And then we talked a little bit about excommunication, the three levels of excommunication, and we talked about the 24 offenses punishable by excommunication. Then uh, Yeshua did something that I, I should have mentioned last week. Yeshua ignored the edict of excommunication, didn't he? Yeshua didn't stay away from this guy. Yeshua uh, uh, sought him out and said to him, do you believe in the, in the Messianic person? Do you believe in the Son of Man? So he ignored that, uh, the authority of the rabbis there as well. And uh, we saw at the end of the lesson last week the process of this man's spiritual apprehension. Uh, he started out in spiritual darkness when he said, a man healed me in, in uh, John 9, 11. Jesus was just a man who healed him from his uh, lifelong bondage to blindness. But as the chapter unraveled, he began to see that Jesus was more than a man. He was a prophet in John 9, 17. He continues to stand against the Pharisaic view of Jesus by saying he is from God in John 9, 34. Then he moves out of spiritual darkness into spiritual light when Yeshua says to him, do you believe in the Messianic person, the uh, Son of Man? And he says, yes, I believe. And he not only moves from spiritual darkness to salvation and spiritual light, but he moves to worship as well. And again, that's the same pattern all of us went through in this room. We have, it took us a while. Every single one of us went through a process to come to believe that Jesus is the God-man and to give him the worship he deserves. All right. That brings us now to section 158, the allegory of the good shepherd and the thief. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Now, as we get into John 10, we're going to come across the sixth of John's seven discourses. This is called the discourse of the good shepherd. Remember, John is built around sevens. We're also going to run across the third of John's seven I am's. I am the door to the sheep in verse 8, and then repeat it in verse 9. I am the door. And then we're going to run smack dab into the fourth of the seven I am's. I am the good shepherd. That's in verse 11 and verse 14. So we begin with the thought that the Messiah is the true shepherd in the middle of page 15. Now, before we get into that, uh, some background verses for this, these statements that Jesus makes. First of all, Psalm 23, verse 1. David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So in Psalm 23, we see that God himself, Yahweh, is a personal shepherd to David, and he's the personal shepherd to us as well. Each one of us are one of his sheep, just as this uh, shepherd here in Israel stands guard over his flock. So he's our personal shepherd, a uh, very um, intimate relationship with us. In Psalm 80, verse 1, we learn something else. There we read, O give ear, shepherd of Israel. So the Lord is not only the personal shepherd, but he's the shepherd of the nation, the shepherd of Israel. You who lead Joseph like a flock, there's a generic term for all Israel. You who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. And of course, that's a reference to the, to the uh, Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in the temple, where the, um, the Shekinah glory would appear between the cherubim above the Ark of the Covenant. And then finally, in Isaiah 40, 11, we learn something else about the shepherd. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. And so here, we, here we see the love and concern and care of the shepherd for his flock. Just as a human she shepherd does all those uh, tasks for his sheep, so God will tend us and gather us and carry us and gently lead us. So that's the background to the upcoming discourse on the good shepherd. So let's begin with uh, verses 1 through 5. So verse 1 is at the very bottom of page 148 in your harmony. So go, it's only one verse at the bottom there. 
And we'll read from verse 1 through verse 5. So everybody there? Everybody get zeroed in? All right. Verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who, does, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the, she the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he puts forth his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. So the picture is that of an early morning scene. The uh, sun has just come up over a Nazareth, for example. And the uh, shepherd goes down to the communal sheepfold to take care of his sheep. And here is the communal sheepfold at the Nazareth village. Uh, when you go to Israel, this is a great place to visit. It is a, uh, a village put together by uh, Arab Christians, and it depicts accurately the technology and the lifestyle of uh, a first century Jewish person. And, um, very, and uh, very accurately, this is where Jesus grew up in Nazareth, his lifestyle. In fact, there's a there is a quarry, a first century quarry, on the grounds that Joseph and Jesus may have very well worked with their own hands. It's a great place to visit. But here they put together the village sheepfold. And uh, in the village sheepfold, it's a communal sheepfold with a number of uh, flocks in that, um, in that enclosure. And you see the door, there's a doorkeeper there, so the shepherd will come, and he's got to separa separate out his sheep from the mass of sheep that are in there. So how does he do that? He calls them by name because the shepherds would give names to every single sheep. And the sheep would recognize his voice and they would come to him. Then he would lead them out. The doorkeeper would allow him to lead his sheep out of the sheepfold. Now, the doorkeeper was there to prevent any thieves and robbers from scaling the wall and, and uh, being up to no, no good. If a robber wanted to steal one of the sheep in the sheepfold, uh, the doorkeeper wouldn't let him through the gate there, would he? He'd have to climb over the wall on the left-hand side there, right? And he'd have to drop a sheep over the wall and uh, then make off with it. He'd have to come in some other way. Do you see the picture there? All right. So the, the, the shepherds yeah, the shepherds would... Yes, they understand those names. They, they, they speak back, they say, is that you? Is that you? <laughs> Roger is in well and good form tonight. Speaking about it, it's really bad. Yeah, it's re <laughs> <laughs> Great, good, Cindy. You really did a bad one there, Roger. Okay, thank you, Cindy. All right, enough for the evening. <laughs> All righty. Yes, the, uh, the shepherd, they, uh, sheep are not considered very bright, but they're bright enough to, rec uh, to recognize the shepherd's voice and to follow him, you know? And, uh, you know, we're just like those sheep, right? We will recognize our shepherd's voice and we follow him. Do I do, dare say that we're not too bright either? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> All righty, let's go on to... Uh, the point here, the point is that the Pharisees are thieves and robbers who have climbed in through another way. And they've g gained control of the people through self-proclaimed authority. There is no authority given to the rabbis, to the Pharisees, in the, in the Bible. Actually, the leadership authority is given to the priests. So they've gained control of the sheepfold of the sheepfold of Israel by exercising the authority of the Mishnah. How did they do that? By making it mandatory. Both its positive uh, commandments, its prohibitions, and its punishments. As we saw, as we looked at um, excommunication last week. And so they exercise authority through another way. It's not a biblical authority. It's through the traditions. But in contrast, Messiah is the true shepherd 
Messiah came exercising true authority. All right, let's take a look at verse number six. Verse number six. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Yeshua's method of teaching the masses ever since his rejection is coming out. He's using a parabolic form of teaching. He's using figures of speech. And so they don't understand what he's talking about in spite of the biblical background. And I shared just a little glimpse of the biblical background with you at the beginning. In spite of that biblical background about God being the shepherd, uh, the truth is hidden from them. All right, lesson nine, page 16, top of the page now. Messiah the door, verses seven through 10. Now let's pick this up on verse 7 and 8. Verse 7, Jesus therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Now here's another kind of sheepfold. I would call this a um, sheepfold out in the pasture or a wilderness sheepfold, something like that. When the shepherd has his sheep out in the pastures, feeding on the grass, in the, uh, say in the spring, uh, he's not coming back to the village every night, so he would build a sheepfold out of rocks, out of stones, sticks, briars, whatever he could find to enclose and protect the sheep, keep them from wandering off at night. And so here you can see one of those, uh, uh, reproduction of one of those kind of uh, informal sheep folds. And you see a lot of the sticks there are pointing outward like, like, um, like spears. That's to uh, discourage any wild animals from uh, getting over that little wall and, and getting at the shepherd's sheep. So this is another kind of sheep fold uh, that the shepherds would use. And in verses 7 and 8, he, re he reiterates, he repeats that the Pharisees are like the thieves and robbers who come in the improper way. But in contrast, Yeshua has come to do two things. Verse 9, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and, and out and find pasture. So the first thing he did was to come and provide salvation. And salvation is pictured in the statement that the sheep enter the sheepfold by the proper door. You know, salvation is not just a uh, up for grabs. Uh, you must come to salvation the proper way. And he says, I am the door. Now, why does he say that? Well, he's referring to a... Um, sheepfold out in the pasture land where the shepherd would allow one opening in the sheepfold. And then at night, where would, the, where would the shepherd lie down? The shepherd would lie down right there. He literally would become the door to the sheep. Any sheep that wanted to get out had to go over him. Any animal that wanted to get in had to go over his body. I am the door. He is the only way and the proper way in and out. And he guards his sheep in that position. Cindy. What is the Hebrew word for door? No, no, no. Hadavar is word. Delet, yes. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. You know, I can't answer that just right off the top of my head. I don't have that memorized in the Hebrew. <laughs> What's the word for door? Delet. D E L E T. All right, and I'm not saying that's the only word, but uh, all right, well, let's go on then. All right, so first of all, he is the door. And secondly, he came to provide power for daily living. And power for daily living is illustrated in the picture of the sheep going in and out and finding pasture. The sheep are going about their normal daily activities, and yet they're getting nourishment and prospering because he's allowing them in and out. They have a place of safety, a place of refuge, but they also can go out with the permission of their shepherd and do daily activities. All right, let's move on to verse 10. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life 
and might have it abundantly. Now Yeshua, of course, the point is that he is the only door through whom salvation and power for daily living are achieved. Power for daily living and salvation are not going to be achieved through the Mishnah. It's not going to be achieved through the traditions of the fathers. And please note the contrast. The thief takes life, but the Messiah gives life. And he gives it to the full. So remember here, he is the only door. Here's a picture of that village sheepfold again. He is the only door. All right, page 16 in the middle now. Messiah the Good Shepherd. Let's read verses 11 through 15. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hireling and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hireling and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. All right, number one, he emphasizes that he is the true shepherd and he proves the accuracy of this statement by acting like a good shepherd. He owns, he cares for, he feeds, he protects, he dies for his sheep. He's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. In our um, figures of speech, we would say something like, he's willing to take a bullet for us. And he was, but he was willing to take the cross for us. He's our good shepherd. Then the second point is in verses 16 through 18. 16 through 18. And I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down of my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. So the second point is that someday there's going to be a unity between two separate flocks. They're going to be unified into one. But he puts this in terms they cannot understand. Now, later on in the epistles, we learn that he's referring to his body, which is the church. His body is one flock. The church is one flock. Now the first flock he's talking about is the Jewish flock. This is the one he's referring to here in context. But then he has other sheep that are not of this flock. He's referring to the fact that he will gain other sheep in the future. So that's his reference to Gentile sheep. And so the two... Jew and Gentile are put together into this one flock. And that's the point that uh, Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, picks up in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, Messiah Yeshua, for the sake of you Gentiles, then he goes off on a little rabbit trail, it's very important here. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of the Messiah. All right, now what is this mystery? What is it, and what does it consist of? He now explains it. Which in other generations was not made known to the sons of man, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. So a mystery in the Bible is something that needs to be revealed, not something that needs to be figured out. You know, not like a whodunit. But God has to reveal it to us. What did he reveal? To be specific. Now this was never re revealed in the Old Testament. It is now revealed in the New Testament. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of Messiah Yeshua, through the gospel. 
That was never understood through the Old Testament revelation. And now it is understood. Okay, make sense? All right, th those are the, t the uh, flocks brought together, uh, the two flocks brought together into one. Now, Paul picks this up using the picture of the olive tree in Romans 11. The uh, natural branches and the wild branches grafted into one tree. For example, Romans 11:17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, so he's talking to the uh, Gentile believers in Rome, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them, and that's the Jewish Christians, of the rich root of the olive tree. So there's that picture, one tree and two kinds of branches. Also, in verse 24, if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So again, we see the two different types of branches in the olive tree. And you guys have seen this before, but I I've got to do it for you again. The natural branches, the natural olives are the Jewish Christians, right? The Jewish believers. And the majority of people in this room are the wild olives. <laughs> the Gentile believers. You get, I get the pits, you guys get the pimentos. Yeah, there you go. All right. All right. So we're all on the same olive tree. Okay? In contrast, in contrast, the hireling, somebody hired to look after the sheep, has no real concern for the sheep. The true shepherd will die for the sheep. The hireling could care less. He will flee from the wolf. Now... Before we move on, I just want to make a comment. And my comment lies, uh, is about the fact that we Jewish people have been labeled Christ killers for centuries. And we, by, uh, by anti-Semites, both in the church and outside the church, we have been held solely accountable for the crucifixion of Jesus for eternity. And so some people would say that you know, your Jewish friends today are responsible for the death of Messiah. Uh, you'll see that today. Now, in reality, the Bible t states that there are seven parties responsible for the Messiah's death. And uh, I want you, if you're interested in this topic, it's a very important topic, I want you to pick up my little booklet, Who Killed Yeshua? I have copies of it here. I've got 40 copies up front here. The, uh, the copies with the pretty... The pretty cover are new ones, but I, and I have old gray ones there too. The material is exactly the same, even if the cover isn't so pretty. No, it's the print's all the same. <laughs> okay. Well, you can read it to your neighbor. Um, but anyway, it's, some of them say a dollar fifty on them. Please ignore that. If you are interested in the booklet, please pick it up. I put them over there for you. Now, the Jewish people are indeed one of the seven responsible parties. We do bear one-seventh of the responsibility, but there are six more. Now, here in this paragraph, two of the other responsible parties are highlighted. Number one, Yeshua is one of the responsible parties for his own death because he chose to lay down his life on our behalf. His own initiative in verse 18 Okay, secondly, in verse 18, he was commanded to lay down his life by his father. So God the Father bears responsibility for Yeshua's death. This was planned from eternity past. This is something that this didn't, didn't jump out of the woodwork all of a sudden. This has been planned from eternity past. So it's not accurate to blame the Jewish people alone for Yeshua's death. So here, Yeshua takes appropriate responsibility, and the Father takes appropriate responsibility. So again, if you want the details on all seven responsible parties, uh, pick up my little booklet here. Now, it's important that you know this information and be ready to share it with your Jewish friends. Why? Because, say again? Exactly, because your Jewish friends are going to be standing there and percolating in the back of their mind is the idea, oh, these guys consider me a Christ killer. We know about our history of anti-Semitism. 
Unfortunately, most people in the church are not aware of church history and how gruesome it has been for the Jewish community. So you need to be aware of this uh, topic. So when it comes up, you can explain that, no, the Jewish people are not solely and eternally responsible for the death of Yeshua. Let me, let me show you what the Bible says. Pull out that little booklet and go through it with them, okay? Okay, I once did that with an anti-missionary. You know, well, how can you be, be a believer with those Christians that just call us Christ killers, you know? Hold us responsible for the death of Yeshua. So I went through this material with her. Shocked her. She, her, she had never even considered or heard of the other six responsible parties. I didn't, didn't stop her from being an anti-missionary, but it did bring her up short, okay? So please, this is a very important topic. Um, be familiar with this issue who killed Yeshua alrighty let's see now how much time do I have let's see let's go through let's go through section 159 and then we'll take our break alright page 17 at the top of the page section 159 further division among the Jews let's read verses 19 through 21 that's at the bottom of page 149 Section 159, further division among the Jews, John 10, 19 through 21. There arose a division among the Jews because of these words. And many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? And others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? So here we see a good Jewish argument, you know, with screaming and shouting and hand waving, you know, over the person of Yeshua. And now you need to notice that it's the multitudes who are also voicing the accusation of the Pharisees. Many of them said, he has a devil, he's demon-possessed and insane. So this accusation that we saw in Matthew chapter 12 of demon possession is being voiced over and over again, and now the masses are picking up what the Pharisees have been saying. Now, you guys, there is no fence walking with Yeshua. These people in this paragraph are voicing the only two options we can take over Jesus. He is either God's representative of the kingdom of light, he's the Messiah, or he is the, he's Satan's representative of the kingdom of darkness. There is no other position you can take with Yeshua. You have to either accept him fully or reject him fully. And on page 17... C.S. Lewis said it very nicely in Mere Christianity. This is a good quote to keep in your mind. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would, be, he would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that door open to us he did not intend to. All right? So he put it well there. Now this lesson so far has been a lesson of conflict. Conflict over the law. Conflict over the light. Conflict over the person of Yeshua. Conflict over the healing of the blind man. And finally now conflict over the shepherd. Now, for you, those of you on YouTube who are watching this, I don't know who is watching this, um, this class on YouTube, but perhaps a similar conflict is raging in your heart over Yeshua. So this uh, paragraph tells us that you must make your choice. And what I'm asking you to do is to make your choice for Jesus. Make him the Lord of your life. Come to him for spiritual light and for salvation and for freedom. Make him your object of faith and of trust. You know, the biblical word is repent, to change your mind. Change your mind about who he is and trust him 
and he will deliver you from sin and from Satan and from death. And he'll give you power for daily living and he'll become your good shepherd. So heed, please heed this short section, John 10, verses 19 through 21. All righty, that brings us to our break. So go ahead and take your break and we'll pick it up on section 160. All righty, let's pick it up then on section 160. We're in lesson nine, page 18, at the top of the page. Section 160, another attempt to stone or arrest Yeshua for blasphemy. We continue through John, John 10, picking it up on verses 22 and 23. That's on the next page. Uh, page 150 in your harmonies. All right, verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So now it's winter, it's December. Now back in sections 153 through 159, we were at the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall, in September. And between verses 21 and 22 of John 10, there is a three-month jump from Tabernacles in September to Hanukkah in December. So we are at the feast known as Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights, the Feast of Dedication. We have just jumped three months forward. Now this is the only place in the Bible where Hanukkah is mentioned. Hanukkah was inaugurated during the intertestamental period. So it is not mentioned in the Old Testament, and it's only mentioned here in the New Testament. Now, while it is not an Old Testament feast, it is valid because Yeshua celebrates it here. Now let's take a look at the location of the incident. Here's a, a portrayal of Herod's Temple Mount, and Jesus was in the portico of, portico of Solomon. The portico of Solomon is this very long portico along the eastern side of the temple platform. And uh, looking at the temple platform from the west, looking back to the east with the Mount of Olives in the background, you can see part of the portico of Solomon in this drawing right there. And uh, this is a picture taken inside the, the uh, Israel Museum model of Solomon's portico and now from Glow Bible we're standing in the middle of the temple uh, platform we're looking north down the extended length of the uh, portico of Solomon and then we're going to turn 180 degrees and look to the south and you can see the royal portico in the background there to the south so it's very very long sheltered area on the east side of the Temple Mount is where he is teaching now the multitudes come to him in verse 24 and they ask him a question. Verse 24. The Jews therefore gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Well, they're accusing him of being obscure, aren't they? You never told us plainly that you are the Messiah. Now these are Judeans, of course, this is uh, activity in Jerusalem, in Judea, and of course they're accompanied by religious leaders as well. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you did not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. So Jesus answers to the contrary, I did tell you plainly. The problem is you didn't believe. And remember, we've seen him state that I told you through, number one, my words, and I told you, number two, through my works. The miracles that he did authenticated his words, that he was the Messiah. So the works were the, uh, the uh, second witness to his, the, the truth of his statement. Verses 26 and 27. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, the problem isn't that he was not plain. The problem lies in the fact that they're not his sheep. And the reference to his sheep 
is the clear link uniting this conversation in December with the similar conversation that took place three months earlier at the Feast of Tabernacles in, um, starting in section 158. The, uh, the common element is the fact that he's the shepherd of the sheep. That's what joins the two uh, the dialogues together. Verse 28. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. And they shall never perish. This is a very good and strong passage for eternal security. There are many people that do not believe that they are eternally secure, that they can lose their salvation. But guys, eternal life is exactly that, eternal life. Jesus did not promise temporary life. I've come that they may have temporary life and have it to the full. No, that's not what he says. Eternal life. All right, but Yeshua has been, uh, been accused of being obscure. So, he's going to give them a clear answer. Now we're at page 19 at the top in uh, verses 29 and 30. Verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Okay, is he being obscure now? Well, take a look at footnote number three. You see at the end of uh, the word one, there's a little number three. Drop down to the bottom of the paragraph, and you'll see some footnotes. Footnote one, two, and then three on the right-hand side, where it says literally neuter, meaning a unity of one essence. Because it's neutered in the Greek, it speaks of one essence. So basically, he's saying, I am one in essence with God. I am the God-man. Do the Jewish people understand what he's saying? Verse 31. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. You see, they, don't exactly, they know exactly what he's claiming. He's claiming deity here. Verse 32. Yeshua answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father, for which one of them are you stoning me? So this charge of obscurity has gone out the window. They uh, comprehend very clearly who he claims to be. So Jesus says, okay, before you cast these stones, tell me which good work deserves uh, my death. Verse 33. The Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you. So they had no argument with that. They couldn't refute the good works, could they? Can't refute healing a man born blind. Can't refute the casting out of a deaf and dumb demon. Can't refute the healing of a leper. Okay? For a good work we do not stone you but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. All right. So much for charges of obscurity. They recognize and understand very clearly who he claims to be. Now guys, gals, don't let anyone intimidate you or get away with that silly statement, Jesus never claimed to be God. He claimed to be God in no uncertain terms, but he claimed to be God from a Jewish perspective. No, you will not find in the Bible Jesus saying, I am God. And that's what unbelieving quibblers are looking for. Now show me where Jesus said, I am God. Take them right here. Take them right here. Okay? They're just quibbling, trying to find excuses to avoid the obvious when a person says, Jesus never claimed to be God. They're just trying to avoid the obvious. Same thing. Ignoring the evidence. Quibbling away the evidence rationalizing away the evidence. If someone will just read the text here and take it for what it says, you see very clearly that Jesus claimed to be God and his audience knew it. Okay? Does that make any sense? Yes? What do you mean by it from a Jewish perspective? Well, because uh, from a Western perspective, we want to see Jesus say, I am God. Okay. But from a Jewish perspective, he says, I and the Father are one. All right, what does that mean? That means we're of one essence. What is the conclusion you draw? 
I am God. Okay? Okay? And from the background of the uh, Old Testament, the prophets, for example, taught consistently that the messianic person would be the God man. Okay? So he's not being he's not being Western in his thinking, he's being Eastern in his thinking. Okay? Right, okay. Right. Yeah, they're not looking for that. That's true. Exactly. Even though the Messianic prophecies teach that, they're not looking at that. Remember that uh, two edged Messianic coin? They flopped it down. The reigning Messiah is on top. Exactly, exactly. He, he will affirm both sides of the Messianic person. Yeah. The suffering Messiah and the reigning Messiah. Exactly. All righty. Now, they're impressed with the Pharisaic mode of thinking, and Jesus now gives them a Pharisaic argument. It's called, a, in, uh, in Hebrew, it's called a Kalva Homer argument, from the light to the heavy, from the minor premise to the major premise. So if the minor premise, the light premise is true, how much more is the major premise, the heavy premise? That's the idea here. So verses 34 through 38. Yeshua answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. All right, in this little argument, he directs them to Psalm 82, verse 6. Okay, here's Psalm 82. Let's see the context of this. Psalm 82, God takes his stand in his congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. Here's his judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah, think about it. Pause, think about it. So God is issuing a judgment here, and it's not a pretty one, is it? All right, here is the job that his judges are supposed to do. Here's their job description. Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. That's the job description for God's judges. But there's a problem. Here's the problem. Speaking of the judges, they do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. And here God pronounces his judgment on his human judges. I said, you are gods. You are Elohim. You are gods. And all of you are the sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. There's the judgment upon them. And then the praise, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is you who possesses all the nations. All right. In verse 6, Psalm 82 uses the term Elohim, gods, and it applies the terms to Israel's human judges. Now, in what sense were Israel's judges gods or Elohim? They were Elohim in the sense that they were God's representative authorities. They received delegated authority from God to do the work of God, to, to uh, care for the downtrodden. We saw that job description. And because of that, they were in that sense Elohim, little gods doing the work given to them by the true and living God. So he's speaking of the office here, not of the men. And in Psalm 82, unrighteous men now hold the office of judge, and they are held responsible to it. Verse 20, verse 20 uh, page 20, excuse me, lesson 9, page 20. So basically the argument goes like this. So how could it be bl blasphemy for the Messiah to claim to be the Son of God since he did not receive transmitted or delegated authority? but he received direct authority from the Father to do the works of the Father. 
if it's appropriate to call the office of judge Elohim, it could hardly be wrong for him to call the Messiah himself the Son of God, because his authority is not transmitted but given directly. If they, if it was, if it was appropriate to call humans gods because of their position, how much more appropriate is it to call the Messiah God? You see the argument there? If humans can be labeled that way, the Messiah can be labeled that way. Mm -hmm. okay. The Lord our God is one. Mm -hmm. And now we have a messianic person who is declaring himself to be God, mm -hmm. equal with God. So now we have a duality. Okay. In the framework of a God. Mm -hmm. they, they could not accept the duality. Well, but that's true in the first century. A Messiah that was not a God. Uh, true, but they are violating scripture to do that. But would they know that? If, yes. If they were laboring under the of the yes, if they... If they honored scripture, they would see that the, the Messianic prophecies teach that the Messianic person would be the God-man. And if they honored scripture, they would see the Trinity. The Trinity, the triune nature of God, is clearly taught in the Old Testament. I have uh, two but books of... taught by the Pharisees to the people, right? They were so, not teaching that. No, they were not teaching that, so no. the people were getting their yeah. influences from their ascetic teaching. Yeah, the people were not taking responsibility to learn the word of God. They had the word of God. It was taught in the sh in, on Shabbat in the synagogue all the time. Yeah, the responsibility is there. It's all there, all laid out. But it could be that they were conflicted. Well, if they were committed to the word of God, they would not be. That's the problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Question. Sure, but you've yes, you have to be seeking truth. That's your responsibility. You come to Scripture seeking the truth and seeking the plain meaning of the text. You will understand it. God will make sure you understand it. Definitely. Okay, one more question. Yes. Yeah. Well, you cannot prove, you cannot prove the triune nature of God simply from the word Elohim. It does point to that. It is consistent with that. But you have to use all the revelation in Scripture to bring out that point. And it is very clear when you bring out all the information in the Old Testament on that subject, you see very clearly that God is triune. He's echad. He's a compound unity, according to the Shema. So everything points in only one direction, starting with Elohim, but just the, that word alone doesn't prove it. Okay, it just indicates the direction. <laughs> okay. All righty, let's take on to let's go on to verse thirty-nine in their response to his answer, their response to his argument. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. So they recognize who he claims to be. If he is not who he claims to be, he's guilty of blasphemy and should be stoned. And that is their conclusion. This guy deserves death. But any attempt to kill him prematurely fails, just like it does here. And remember, there's no fence walking possible with Yeshua. You either accept him fully or reject him fully. And they are rejecting him fully. Now... Let me ask a question at this point. We've seen that in the temple they've wanted to stone Yeshua on occasion before, right? And now they want to do the same thing. Where did they get stones heavy enough to do the job? Okay. You know, stoning a person is not done with pebbles, is it? No. Well, hang on, hang on. Okay. I know of three opinions. I'll share three opinions with you. Uh, two opinions and my opinion, okay? <laughs> all right. First of all, Dr. Alfred Edersheim, in Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, he seems to think that the stones were debris located in the court of the Gentiles. 
But I think that's rather unlikely because temple courts were kept rather clean of stones and to stone somebody, the Jewish method of stoning somebody, was to push them off a drop of at least 10 feet. If that drop did not kill them, then they would drop huge heavy stones on the person's body and crush them that way. So stoning was done with big, huge, heavy stones. So I don't think the temple court was littered with these big, huge, heavy stones. All right. Secondly, others note that the temple was under construction. And therefore, the men ran to the construction site and gathered some heavy building stones. That's a possibility, uh, more likely, although I don't think it's the best possibility. Let me submit to you another possibility, and this one is connected with the Feast of Tabernacles. We're at the Feast of Hanukkah, we're at the Feast of Tabernacles right now, and this coordinates with that. Now, in uh, the book of 1 Maccabees, we read about the historical event called Hanukkah. Now, the book of 1 Maccabees is not a canonical book, it is a Jewish historical book. It is considered good history, but it is not inspired. Now, in the book of 1 Maccabees, the Greeks are defeated and the defiled temple is cleansed. Now, go to page 21 at the top. And part of that cleansing process is described in 1 Maccabees 4, 41 through 47. And I'll put it up on the screen here and read it for those on YouTube. Then Judas, this is Judas Maccabee, the leader of the rebellion. This is the rebellion against the Greeks. Uh, then Judas appointed certain men to fight against those that were in the fortress until they had cleansed the sanctuary. So he chose priests of blameless conversation, such as had pleasure in the law, who cleansed the sanctuary and bear out the defiled stones into an unclean place. And when, they, and, and when, as they consulted what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which was profaned, see the altar was profaned because the Greeks offered uh, pigs up on the altar, and they spread a, a pig's broth all over the place there, so the altar was defiled with unclean offerings. They thought it best to pull it down, pull the, pull the altar down, lest it should be a reproach to them, because the heathen had defiled it. Wherefore, they pulled it down and laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should come a prophet to show them what should be done with them. And they took the whole stones according to the law and built a new altar according to the former. So according to 1 Maccabees, the defiled stones of the second temple altar were stored on the temple mount because the Maccabees didn't know what to do with them. The stones were not defiled enough to remove them from the temple mount, but they were defiled enough not to be used as the altar. All righty. Hang on, hang on, okay, it's okay, okay, Cynthia? All right. <laughs> okay, they were stored away. Notice the ironic part. They were stored away until the prophet would appear to explain to them what God wanted done with those stones, how they would be disposed of. All right, now we go to the Mishnah, Midot 1.6. Midot details the, the um, dimensions and construction of Herod's temple. It describes Herod's temple. And here's Midot 1.6. There were four rooms in the chamber of the hearth, like cells opening into a hall, two within the holy ground and two outside the holy ground. And what was their use? That on the southwest was the chamber of the lamb offerings. That to the southeast was the chamber of them that made the showbread. In that to the northeast, the sons of the Hasmoneans, that's the Maccabees, had hidden away the stones of the altar which the Grecian kings had defiled. All right. Midot 1.6 tells us two things. The defiled stones were present on the Temple Mount, and they tell us exactly where the stones were located. Now, the Art Scroll Tanakh commentary on Hanukkah tells us that the room in which the stones were hidden is called the Beit HaMokad. Now, here is the Herodian Temple Mount. Where is the Beit HaMokad? It's getting closer to the temple. Here's a close-up. Now, the Beit HaMokad is one of two buildings. It is either this building to the west, or it is this building toward the center of the Temple Mount. We're not sure exactly which one it is. 
Now you have this drawing on page 22. This comes from the Jewish Encyclopedia. And they take the position that the chamber of the hearth was the building in the center of the Temple Mount here. So here is the chamber of the hearth in your drawing. Okay, see that? The chamber of the hearth. Now this drawing you received back on lesson 7 on page 22. So you have this drawing. This is by Lean Rittmeyer. He is the premier archae architectural archaeologist of the day. So say that fast, three times. Architectural archaeologist, three times fast, okay? And he feels that the chamber of the hearth is here. See it here? This room right there. So those are the two different positions on the chamber of the hearth. So let's return to our Jewish encyclopedia version. In the chamber of the hearth, we have two chambers inside the holy precinct, num numbers 13 and 11. And we have two chambers outside the holy precinct, number 12 and number 14. And if you look on your, on your key, the last chamber there is chamber 14. You see that at the bottom of the, le of the list on the uh, left? The chamber of the stones of the defiled altar. So according to this drawing, that's exactly where the stones were kept. Right there, chamber 14 in your drawing. Now, going back to the other drawing, we have two chambers uh, linked with the holy precincts here and two chambers outside the holy precincts, there. And where is the chamber of the defiled altar stones? That one right there. So there's the second opinion regarding the construction of the temple and where they were located. And here we have an, uh, even have a drawing from an orthodox source, Carta's Illustrated Encyclopedia of the Holy Temple, showing the inside, the uh, uh, projected inside of the chamber of defiled stones or seals and you see the um, uh, activity going on on the sides of the room and there in the corner are all the altar stones all piled up okay they they're keeping them there in case until the prophet would come to tell them what to do with them all right well those stones yeah they weren't always all that big. Now, my point is, could these stones be the ones that they used to try and execute the Son of God? Could they have found some large stones that were uh, big enough to carry and try to execute him? Well, I think they did. This is my opinion. You can take it or leave it. I think Yeshua was teaching somewhere in this area of the uh, portico of Solomon, somewhere in here. And from this area, it'd be very easy for a priest or Pharisees to go over to one of those two buildings, either the Beit HaMakot, either to the west or to the east, one of those two buildings, and select a couple of stones that were big enough to do the job and then hurry back to this area and try to stone him. Now, how would they stone him? Well, notice that right in that area is the western wall, is the uh, Golden Gate. There's the Golden Gate of Herod's temple. Let's go in close. Let's take a close up here. See it there? And now we'll get in even closer. They, they could have easily hustled him down the stairs and out the, uh, out the gate there and you're on a platform a good 10 feet above the ground. They would now be outside the temple area. They could shove him off the platform and if he was not killed in that fall they could just drop the huge stones on him and finish the job of stoning. That simple. Sure. Yeah, you could do that. Sure. If he's if he. Yeah. Yeah. That's very good. That's a. Sure. 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 Of course, they might be thinking that way. This man is defiled. He's a sinner. He uh, violates the Sabbath. He calls himself God. He's a blasphemer. Be very appropriate to kill a defiled man with defiled stone. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Now, here is the Wester, uh, the uh, Golden Gate as we see it today. I took this picture from the um, Mount of Olives. 
And underneath, this is Suleiman the Magnificent's stonework. Underneath, underneath that Arab graveyard in the front, that Muslim graveyard, is the Golden Gate, the first century Golden Gate. Now here's another view of the Golden Gate as it looks today, but this is the above ground section only. Now we're on the Temple Mount here, and we're looking at the inside of that gate, and we'll walk over to the uh, railing there and look down. Uh, there you in see the inside of the gate, and there uh, below that floor level is the first century level. The first century level is below that. Now here's the archaeology. Everything that's gray is above ground. That's what we can see. Everything that is brown is below ground. We can't see, and the Muslims will not give permission to excavate it. But we know there's a gate down there. How do we know? Well, there's a tomb. And uh, we can see the gate right here, and we can see the upper part of the arch of one of those gates protruding into that tomb. That has been seen and photographed. We know those gates are there. Now, an, there's been another photograph taken of the archways there. This is from Biblical Archaeology Review in 2008. This little article reads, In 1969, a young archaeology student named James Fleming was exploring the walls and gates of ancient Jerusalem after a heavy rain the night before. When suddenly, outside of the Golden Gate on the eastern wall of the old city, the ground fell out from under him. Suddenly I felt I was part of a rock slide, Fleming wrote. Down I went into a hole eight feet deep. He found himself surrounded by human bones. Okay, it, was a, it was a graveyard. But he also saw something. He also saw the top of an arch of a gateway and he photographed it. You can see the archway at the top and you can see that this this gate, the Golden Gate, the first century Golden Gate has been blocked up. So it is in existence down there and uh, uh, we know that's the gate that Yeshua went through. You can also see Warren's wall to the front. Uh, the, the archaeologist Charles Warren went down 41 feet and tunneled 55 feet along that wall to the north and 14 feet along that wall to the south. A gutsy guy. I would, never, I would never create a tunnel that deep along that wall. So we know a little bit of the archaeology there, but we're not allowed to excavate it because that's all part of a Muslim graveyard today. All of this is underneath the graves that are uh, on the present ground level. So there the, is the photograph. The photograph was taken of the northern po uh, northernmost side of one of these two arches. Uh, so we know that those, that gate is there, buried under the current Golden Gate. So, I think that it's been very, very logical to uh, take Yeshua down to this spot and try to execute him right there. That's the opinion I have, and that's uh, my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> but the... Uh, the irony lies in the fact that the stones were being stored there awaiting God's prophet, awaiting instructions from God's prophet. And now the prophet par excellence has come and he's rejected rather than, than uh, appealed to and looked to. So instead of getting instructions on what to do with the defiled stones, they attempt to kill him. So on uh, page 22, you have that drawing from the uh, Jewish Encyclopedia. On page 23, page 24, and page 25, you have an article on Hanukkah. So you can learn all about Hanukkah, and you'll be uh, all set to celebrate it this December. All right, that brings us to section 162 and part 9, and we'll pick that up next week with the question about... Um, in section, whoops, it's section 161. There it is, from Jerusalem to Perea on page 26, part 9. So we'll, we'll get there next week. So let me go ahead and pray, and uh, then I'll turn you loose. Uh, Father, again, we just want to stop and thank you for your word and try to heed the warning of this section that we are to pay attention to your word, and uh, even if we don't like it, we are to realize that it cannot be broken. It is your holy word. It says what it says, and we need to learn to accept it. Now, there are hard parts in your word to accept, but we need to learn to accept it and not be like 
the men that Yeshua was facing here. Uh, people who refused to accept the plain evidence that was there in your word preparing them for the coming of the Messiah. So Lord, help us to be strong in this area and to treasure your word and to share your word, the plain meaning of it, with those around us. Even if we run into those who will quibble and argue and um, try to tell us that it doesn't mean what it says. You said it means what it says and we need to uh, accept that. God said it, we believe it, that settles it. Help us to take that attitude with us into the world and share the good news of the Messiah, the gift of eternal life uh, with all those we meet. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All righty, we'll see you guys next week.